water in that base, and uh, uh, that might be a, a volcano or anything that would take place up here. So we don't want to have to deal with flood today, do we? I'll be praying for folks on the East Coast, shouldn't we? Uh, we're blessed, and you know we think we've got problems in life. Can you imagine waking up tomorrow morning, everything you ever owned is underwater, grounded, or uh, ruined? And you have to start over. And so remember, life could always be worse. <coughs> you got your Bible for this morning. Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is where we'll uh, be one of our texts that we take today. I encourage you to get the handouts, the home guides, out in the foyer. I think we uh, have run out and run a few more this morning. If we run out again, we'll uh, run you some more. And I think we'll get a little feedback here, Chris. Um, but Ephesians chapter 5, we'll look at verse 5 here in just a moment, verse 12 as well. From that same chapter, we have been on Sunday mornings uh, getting ready for our fall revival and seeking personal holiness. We've been looking at uh, specific areas of sins, and this morning we're going to look at the area of the sins of commission. What that simply is, a sin of commission is simply this, it's any action that you and I take to break God's laws or His commands. We commit a sin as commission. We do something to break God's law or His command. That is a, a sin. A sin of commission. But before we begin to look at that area, let's have prayer together. Okay, Father, thank You for Your Word as it speaks. Thank You for Your Spirit as it convicts. And Lord, as we search this particular area of our life today, we pray that Your Spirit would be very, very uh, thorough in searching our hearts and may He point out anything in our lives that we need to confess and repent of. And Father, help us to be faithful this morning to deliver the message in a clear manner. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen. amen. Well, this morning here, we're going to cover seven areas in which you and I can potentially break God's law or uh, one of God's commands and sin against Him. The first area we're going to talk about this morning is the area of sexual sin. The area of sexual sin. If you notice there in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5 and verse 5, notice what the Apostle Paul writes there in verse 5. For this you know that no whoremonger, somebody who's out here having sex with everybody that they're not married to, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, the question you need to ask yourself this morning is, have I committed any form of sexual sin? The Apostle Paul makes it very clear there that a genuine believer cannot live in continual sexual sin and not repent of that sin. He's saying someone who lives that type of lifestyle, who is continually committing sexual sin, who goes on and on and on and on, and there's never a place of repentance in their life, something's wrong there, and frankly, Paul says they have no place in the kingdom. There would be a place of self-evaluation for the person who can live in continual sexual sin and never be convicted enough of it to repent of it. You see, any act of sex outside of marriage is a sin. And it is even a shame to glorify sex outside of marriage. If you look down there in verse 12, look what Paul says in the same chapter of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now, this morning I want to honestly ask you to honestly answer the following questions about this particular area of your life. Have you or are you having a sexual relationship with someone you're not married to? <laughs> Do you ever watch television shows or movies filled with sexual sin? As Paul says, a lot of what we uh, take in today and digest is entertainment. Paul says it's a shame to even mention it. It's a shame to glorify what goes on in secret on the movie screen and the television screen. Paul says it's a shame those things are being glorified. Now let me ask you this. Do you ever view pornography in any form? Pornography is one of the biggest <coughs> problems in our society today. It, pornography generates more money than the NFL, Major League Baseball, and the NBA combined. Let that sink in. Some of you are just oblivious to the truth of pornography. It's all over the internet. It's on your phone. It's on your computer. It don't take much. You can bump across it. You don't have to 
to intentionally find it. But viewing pornography, folks, is a serious problem. It is ruining marriages, it's ruining lives, and frankly, it is a sexual sin. Viewing pornography. Do you read books that promote sexual sin? Some of you ladies have got some of them spicy reading books you like to read. That's a form of sexual sin. <coughs> Paul says it's a shame. A shame to talk about these things that people do in secret. Do you dress in a way, ma'am or sir? Do you dress in a way to stir lust for those of the opposite sex? Think about those things this morning. Now, according to Scripture, anyone who does these types of things cannot be truly right with God. Now, our society, and sadly, many believers today have accepted pure filth as entertainment and they no longer view sex outside of wedlock as a sin. May I remind you today, friends, it may be 2018, but God is still a holy God. As Isaiah saw him in Isaiah 6, upon his throne of heaven, and the seraphim cried out, Holy, holy, holy is God. God hasn't changed. He hasn't got updated. He didn't need a revision. God is still holy. Amen. And though you and I may not see a problem with sexual sin, God does, because He's a holy God. You see, God is holy, and we must understand that His standards have not changed just because our society's standards have changed. Secondly, let's move on to the area of our health. Our health. Am I abusing or neglecting the whole of the Holy Spirit, which is our body? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, the Apostle Paul writes this Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You see, this morning, if you're a genuine believer this morning, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place, the home of the Holy Spirit. God dwells within every genuine believer through the person of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the thing. You and I are to take a value our bodies and our health because our body is the vehicle through which God accomplishes His work. Our bodies are the tools in which God does His work. You see, here's the thing. If we're doing anything to hinder or harm our bodies, we are sinning against God. Here's the thing. Now, and listen, this is not easy to say. That includes overeating. Well, Baptists don't like that. I, well, I got one amen. I can't believe that. You heard the joke about the little... Well, uh, about the person asked about what they had to do to be a Baptist, and they said, get saved and own a nine by 13 casserole dish. Amen? <laughs> we don't like to think about overeating as a sin, but it is. Having an unhealthy diet, being uh, lacking exercise or being active, smoking, drinking, using drugs, sexual sin. Listen, hear me this morning. If you're having sex with someone that you're not married to, the next time you crawl in the bed, remember God's in the middle. Or, ooh, so here's what I say. Ooh. <laughs> here's the thing. If you're a genuine believer, God dwells within you. You're taking God to bed with that person that you're fixed to have sex with that you're not married to. That'll kill the blue morning. <laughs> God dwells within you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And you think you get on a back road far enough or somebody's apartment dark enough. Listen, God is there. He's, if you're genuinely saved, you are carrying God with you wherever you go. If it's to the club, if it's to the bar, wherever you are going, God is with you. And you may think it's just you and that individual, but God is there. He's there with you. Because your body is the home, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. You see, here's the thing. Our bodies are the tools in which God is trying to accomplish His work. And sexual sin, just like overeating, smoking, drinking, using drugs, those are all things that harm this body, which is God's home. And that is a sin. Paul said, don't you understand that your body is where the Holy Spirit dwells? I just want to answer these questions this morning. Do you sin against the Holy Spirit's home with harmful habits such as overeating, alcohol, or smoking? Is there any form of drug abuse in your life? 
Are you sinning against the Holy Spirit's home with sexual sin? Paul says it's a sin to sin against our bodies, the home of the Holy Spirit. Let's move on to third. We need to think about the area of sexual sin. Think about our health. Let's move on to third to idolatry. To the area of idolatry. Here's a question you need to ask yourself. Am I placing anyone or anything ahead of God? Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 3 says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon or money. You see, here's the thing. Most people think an idol is that little fat boy statue at the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> we envision an idol as Buddha sitting there <clears throat> or some kind of carved image somewhere that somebody's come up with. But here's the thing. Here's a simple definition of an idol. You see, an idol is anything you and I place ahead of God. Anything or any person we place ahead of God, that's an idol in our lives. What's, what comes first place in your life today? I'll actually answer these questions this morning. Have you put anyone or anything ahead of God? Have you allowed anyone or anything to crowd out your worship and your service of God? Here's a good one. Do you only worship God when you've got everything else done you want to do first? Let me break it down. It's Sunday church option. If I hadn't got something else going on. Has your work or your hobbies become your God? There's a little controversy. I stepped in it last week. I just pile in there again. <laughs> Have you voted for politicians that stand for unbiblical principles? You say, that's getting a little personal. Here's the thing. If you vote for a politician just because that's your party, and that politician's views and the things they support are unbiblical, you have put the opinions of man before God, and you're guilty of idolatry. Mm -hmm. right. You know what, my, i got a button in my office. I vote the Bible. What the Bible says is right is what I'm voting for. I don't care who's running. What does the Bible say is right? That's what I vote for. Let's move on. Some of these blood pressure is rising. <laughs> <laughs> do you spend more time on social media and watching television than you do reading the Bible and praying? That can become an aisle in your life as well. Does going off and having fun and, and fulfilling all your hobbies, does that come before serving God? That can become an idol in your life. Here's a good question this morning. If every member of Bethel Baptist Church lived their Christian life and attended church just like you did, what kind of church would we have? Let's ponder on that just a moment. If every member of Bethel Baptist Church attended church just like you, lived a Christian life just like you, what kind of church would we have? Think about that. How strong would our church be if every member was just like you? If they attended just like you, would we ever have Sunday night or Wednesday night services? Mm. Here's the thing. The devil's done a good job on saving some of you. You think, me as an individual have, I have no influence on this complete body of believers. Oh, yes, you do. How do we have this body of believers? One by one by one by one by one. You add it up and it become a body. You see, every individual member of this church has a vital part in this church. You have influence and you have things that you uh, need to be considering. Now, when we have an outreach ministry, if everybody had the same burden you did or didn't have a burden, would we ever go out in community and reach out to anybody? Would we have a prayer ministry if everybody was just like you? I ask you this morning, who or what is really number one in your life today? Who or what is really number one in your life today? Let's move on number four. To the area of finances. Let's turn the heat up a little. Am I properly handling the money God has entrusted me with? Am I properly handling the money God has entrusted me with? Malachi 3, 8-10 says, He asked the question, Will a man rob God? 
Yet ye have robbed me, God says, but you say, wherein have we robbed thee? God says, in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God has commanded all of His children to give tithes and offerings. You see, failing to tithe is stealing from God. I don't know, uh, you, you know, you probably didn't see it a while ago. There wasn't a great big commotion, but there was some robbery that took place in here a few minutes ago. Everybody in this room was witnesses to a robbery in here just a few minutes ago. There were some folks who stole from God sitting in this building today. Wasn't a gun, wasn't a stick up, nobody says put up your hands. But there was some robbery of God done right here in this building today. And every one of us was witnesses to robbery. You see, here's the thing. Many people think nothing of giving a waiter or waitress a 15% tip. Last week, the average credit card interest rate in America was at 17%. You think nothing of doing those things, giving a waiter or waitress a tip, paying the credit card company, but some of you think giving God 10% is too much. And here's the sad part, it's his own money. You see, we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. What many believers have not, don't understand is this. Uh, uh, you know, maybe you haven't been taught and you don't understand. Listen, everything you and I own belongs to God. Amen. It's not my house and Susie's house. It's the house God allows us to live in. That's not my truck and her car and Lydia's car. It's what God allows us to drive. Everything you and I own are God's. He allows us to be the managers of His resources. How are we managing what He's given us? How many of you would like willingly cheat the IRS? <laughs> Nobody here is willing to cheat the IRS. <laughs> I'm afraid of but you'll cheat God? Let that soak for a moment. You wouldn't dare dream of cheating Uncle Sam. No way do I want to mess with the IRS. I don't think nothing of robbing God. Folks, something's wrong with that. Bad wrong with that. Honestly, answer these questions this morning. Do you fully tie to God or do you give God your leftovers? <clears throat> Let's make it a little more personal. If God led you to give above a tithe, would you give extra? You see, a spirit-filled believer, I love 1 Corinthians where Paul says that God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful in the Greek is where we get our English word for hilarious. <laughs> Did you hear you laughing a while ago? Did anybody seem cheerful about giving? I thought I was at a funeral. <laughs> God loves a cheerful giver. Hey, I get to give him his money back. Think about it this way. All you're doing is returning what's his. It's his anyways. Cheerfully give it back to him. Thank you, Lord. I was able to work this week and I can give it back to you. God loves a cheerful giver. Here's another area that some believers struggle with in finances and that's gambling. Proverbs 13, 11 says this. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Now, as I said a while ago, where many believers fail is they simply don't understand that everything belongs to the Lord and we are just the managers of what God has entrusted us. On our study, in our study on weeds tonight in the book of Proverbs, we say over and over, God promotes work and savings and investing. Here's the what's, preacher, what's wrong with gambling? Gambling is a sin because you and I are trusting chance instead of God. Gambling is a sin because we're trusting chance instead of God. <coughs> you see, gambling is a sin because God's plan is not for you and I to get rich quick. His plan is for us to work hard, to save and invest and spend wisely. That's what God wants us to do with the resources He has entrusted us with. Let me ask you to just consider these questions this morning. 
Think about this. If gambling is such a good thing, it's a good way for you to get rich quick while the casino is getting rich. While the casino is getting larger and larger, you're going deeper and deeper in the hole. You heard of a rigged game? It's a rigged system, folks. If gambling is a harmless activity, why are there so many people addicted to it? Oh, it's harmless, fun, preacher. I'm going to buy a scratch off. That's harmless. Why do you keep going back? And back. And back. If gambling is so good for the economy, look it up. All the places where casinos begin, bankruptcy skyrocket. Gambling is not a good thing. So honestly, answer this question as I move to the next point. Have you been deceived into believing that gambling is a harmless activity? Just remember, everything you and I own belongs to God. Let's move on to number five here this morning. It's the area of the occult. The occult. Here's a question you need to ask yourself this morning. Do I seek guidance from any source other than God? Now Leviticus 19.31 says this, Regard not them that have familiar spirits. It'll be like a psychic. Neither seek ye after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Now the Bible makes it clear that God hates and condemns the use of witchcraft, astrology, and psychics. But in recent years, we've seen an increase in this type of activity, but it's under a new label. It's called New Ageism. That sounds pretty harmless, doesn't it? New Ageism. But here's one of the sub-labels under New Ageism. It's called self-help. Some of you probably have some self-help books at your house right now on your bookshelf. Oprah and Dr. Phil and the like are all self-help shows. Here's what self-help promotes. Self-help promotes you can fix yourself. You just need X, Y, and Z and you can fix yourself. The Christian message is this. You can fix yourself. You need Jesus. Amen. You see the difference? Amen. Our society has bought into Joe Osteen and Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Phil who says you just need a little help and you'll be better on your own. Well, the Bible says we're all sinners and we can't make ourselves better. We must have Jesus to be made better. See the difference? Right. It's real subtle. It seems harmless. Self-help. Go to the bookstore. Six ways to make friends. You know what Proverbs says? Show yourself friend and you'll have friends. Just be a friend to somebody and you'll have friends. You don't need to spend that $25 on that book. The Bible tells you how to be friends. You see, here's the thing. So many people are getting guidance from places other than God's Word. For the believer, our source of guidance should be God found by seeking His face through prayer and Bible study. No believer should have anything to do with astrology, Tarot cards, psychics, crystals, Ouija boards, horoscopes, and self-help stuff. Stay away from it. Because here's the thing. Here's what some of you have done you don't even realize it. You have opened the door to Satan in your home and in your life. Mm -hmm. When you dabble in anything of the occult, you are, you're welcoming Satan to come into your life and your home. Honestly, answer these questions this morning. You consult horoscopes. Psychics or any other form of the You say, oh, preacher, I read the horoscope for fun. Well, I don't do that. Because you know what you're doing? You're flirting with the devil. Leave that stuff alone. Stay away from it. Don't even entertain it. Stay away from that type of stuff. Maybe you read self-help books to make yourself better instead of letting Jesus make you better. Do you allow your children? Listen, a lot of the stuff on Disney Channel now is full of new ageism and new cult. Subtly getting our children to relax and think it's just a cartoon. It's kind of like the dentist. What's, why does a dentist numb you up? Well, I don't want to feel it. Well, that's true. He gets you to relax so you don't feel the work he's doing. Mm -hmm. And Satan has numbed our society with so many things that we have relaxed and we don't feel the work he's doing. He has gotten the next generation to believe that he's not real. 
Satan has accomplished through Hollywood and other things. Our young people today think that Satan is a fellow in a red suit with a ponytail and a pitchfork. Listen, that's not who he is. Paul says he can transform himself and make himself an angel of light to deceive you. Right. He's a master of deception. We walk with us on the Disney Channel, it must be okay. No, it's not. Listen, do your homework. Disney's one of the most ungodly foundations you could ever be a part of. Right. And a lot of their programming, they have now they have they, they have targeted, they're targeting their young people with their programming. Do you seek guidance from any source other than Bible? We'll go on number six here. How about the area of truth? The area of truth. Have I <coughs> compromised God's truth? <clears throat> in any way. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, this is what Jesus said to the church at Pergamos. He says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold or teach the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Jesus was talking to the church of Pergamos and He says, y'all are allowing some false teachings to be taught in your church and I hate that. You compromise on what you know is true and you're allowing untruth to be taught in your church. You see, here's the thing. Today, churches and individuals are being pressured to compromise with evil. We're being pressured to be politically correct and no longer call sin, sin. But here's the thing. The Spirit of God can't work in a church or in a believer where we have compromised God's truth. You see, to compromise God's truth means this. We have put the opinion of man before God. We're more worried about what Hollywood thinks or Washington, D.C. thinks than we are what God says. You see, here's the thing. We've already seen a dramatic increase in this type of pressure in our society. May I say to you, listen to me, dear Christian, it's just getting started. You better say on account the cost and make your mind up if I going to stand for the truth because the oven is the oven is they're slowly ticking the temperature up. And the pressure is getting higher and higher and higher. And the day is coming where you and I will have to make an open decision. Will I stand on God's word and follow Jesus or will I not? It's coming to a town near you and near me. It's coming. We've got to make up our minds. Will we stand for the truth? So I ask you this morning, are you prepared to stand for God's truth no matter the cost? Perhaps you think biblical truths need to be modernized. You know, well, this is 2018. Maybe God ought to change the Bible a little. You know, God's a little rigid on that. That right there, that's, that's a little strict, isn't it? You think that way, friend, you're open for all kinds of deception. When the pressure's on, do you ignore the crowd? I mean, do you know the scriptures and follow the crown with the pressure on it? Let's move on last this morning to the last area. And that is your conscience. Your conscience. Here's a question you ask yourself. Do I have the peace of God about everything I do? Paul says in Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now today, you and I don't have to worry about eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols as it was in biblical times and in the New Testament times. But here's the thing, you and I are still capable of violating our conscience. Well, how can I violate my conscience, preacher? What do you mean? As the verse just said there, when you and I do something and we know that we're not... Well, I don't know, I don't know about that. I'm not really, I'm not really con convicted that that is what I'm supposed to do. I, I, I'm, I'm uneasy about that. I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. Paul says when you and I do something in doubt, it's a sin. We're violating our conscience. God give us a conscience as our alarm system. <coughs> Here's what we say today. My gut tells me. You need your gut, your conscience. God give you a conscience. And when you and I get ready to do something, we go, man, I don't, I don't, I don't man, I'm not, I ain't real sure about that. You're violating your conscience. Here's the thing. Either you have done, or maybe right now you're facing something in your life and you're having to convince yourself regularly that it's the right thing to do. You're violating your conscience. God has given you a conscience. Don't violate it, you see. 
When you, and here's the thing, when you violate your conscience and, 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 and God speaks to you and you're like, man, I don't know. We're ignoring God's still small voice. We're eliminating the work of the leadership of the Holy Spirit and we're doing what we want to do and we're violating and sinning against our conscience. You see, here's the thing. You and I can't live a victorious Christian life depending upon our own flesh. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us in the decisions that we make. So honestly answer these questions this morning. Is there something in your life that you have to continually try to convince yourself about? You have to continually go, yeah, 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 you know, I, this is what, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, that's what i got to do. Listen, when you're right where you ought to be, there ought to be a peace in your life, and it shouldn't be a struggle to do what you're supposed to do. Listen, hey, nothing even better I've found in my life is when I know I'm right where God wants me to be and the peace that He gives me and I have because I know I'm right where I'm supposed to be and I'm doing right what I'm supposed to be doing. That's a wonderful feeling. Is there something in your life that you have to, that you don't have the peace about right now in your life, but you still have many in change? You're just going to go on anyways. I'm not going to worry about the peace of God. I'll do it all the time. Be careful with that. Stop trying to convince yourself of something you know is not right. And listen to God's Spirit as He leads you. I'm going to ask Brother Walter and Ms. Kathy to come. We're going to have a song of invitation, a time of response this morning. Let me ask you. In those seven areas, did God reveal something in your life where you have crossed the line? You have broke His law and broke His commandments. Is there something God spoke to you about in those areas this morning? If so, you have an opportunity to make that right today. Again, I've told you in the past, these home guides are you to take home and use during your personal prayer time as you evaluate your life before God. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe God is... Dealing with your heart right now, He's speaking to you and you hear deep inside you say, I know God's speaking to me that I'm lost. I need to be saved. I'll be standing down front here. I'll be glad to take you. Whatever your need is this morning, as we stand and say, what number, brother? 162. 162 in the blue book this morning.